have the little thoughts that last time we had a good opportunity to meet with um, Abishak and McNally who were playing Settlers of Bhutan together. But I lost again. I was like, ah, <laughs> Alright, well this morning um, we're going to look in the word. The last couple of weeks we've been talking about the gospel. So the first week was we are saved from the penalty of sin. So now um, we have no more guilt, no more shame. Our sins have been taken care of, and we have hope because not only um, did Jesus die and take the penalty of our sin, but He conquered death. So we have we have hope. The second way we talk about we have hope because Jesus conquered death. Or conquered death. So now in our current situation, no matter what we're going through, um, we have hope because we can overcome these things by the power of Jesus, by the power of the gospel, believing in what He says. We have hope. So this week number. Week number three on the gospel, we have hope. Um, we have hope that we are, we will be saved from the presence of sin. So, you know, salvation is amazing. When I was younger, um, I grew up in the church and being around um, the teachings that hey, we're saved and one day Jesus is returning again. I remember there's instances where um, mom and dad. So before, you know, we had like cell phones. Actually, we had a cell phone a lot when I was younger, but. Um, we have one in California, one cell phone. Now we have like six of them, right? Um, but uh, so you know, there's this, there's moments in life. Maybe you guys have heard somebody say this before, but it's totally real and true that it happened to me, where I would come home or be in a certain situation and knew mom and dad were supposed to be here at a certain time, and they weren't at home, and now all of a sudden this fear set in that. Maybe you guys have heard the Left Behind series or something. That, that God came back and mom and dad were gone and I was left there at home all alone. And it was like a real fear. It's like, oh my goodness, I got left and mom and dad are up with Jesus somewhere having a party and I have to worry about my salvation because I didn't go with them. Because I couldn't get a hold of them. Like, okay, they're supposed to be here this time or maybe the maybe meeting went on a little bit longer. So I remember at least one time that was in, in Jacksonville in our house and looking through the house, and I'm like, hey, mom and dad's supposed to be here, where's dad? Um, I think it ended up being a, you know, a church meeting that went a little bit longer, so, you know, that little bit of time lapse was, like, scary for me, all my goodness, I let me So this, but, um, so this morning we are talking about, you know, that, that one day we'll be um, free from the very presence of sin, that one day Jesus is going to return for his bride, us, the church, and he's going to establish his kingdom. He's going to rule and reign over the over the earth in a new heaven and a new earth. And for those of us, um, for those of us that are alive when he comes back, we'll be taken up in heaven with him. But some of us, though, um, Paul talks about those that have passed away. When he passed away, he'll be present with the Lord, where there will be no more sin, no more presence of sin, no more effects of sin. And that's a, that's the hope of our salvation. That's the thing that we dream about. And What's neat is we have participation even now in that future reality. So there one day be a place where there's no more sin, no more pain, no more effects of sin. That's going to be pretty awesome. If you think about the effects of sin, I mean, we think about all the all the anger, all the fights, all the all the sickness, all the disease, uh, all the work that we have to go through even now. Like there'll be a place where there'll be perfect peace, perfect rest, perfect health. No more spider bites for dad. <laughs> no more absence on, um, you know, and things because we'll be in the very presence of God and sin, the effect of sin, will be done away with. So let's look through, we're going to look through a couple of different scriptures today and then at the end respond, I think, in an appropriate way um, that it talks about in Revelations that we as a church can respond to this future hope that we have. So let's pray before we open the word. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And I thank you that you have sent your Holy Spirit. And your Holy Spirit is one that reveals truth to us. So Father, we ask, I ask this morning that your Holy Spirit would be welcome here to speak to us. Father, that our ears would be open. Father, I pray that you would silence any um, other voice that doesn't come from you this morning. That our hearts would be prepared and that our hearts would be full of faith. That when we hear the words of truth, our hearts would jump with joy, Lord, at the sound of truth. Yes. Father, we thank you, God, that you are transforming us to look more and more like you. And we pray that today's message about the gospel, about our future hope that we have, Father, would um, give hope to us, would, would, would give us joy, would 
It was excitement to know that there is a future that we have because Jesus, you're returning, that you are the king over all things. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so first let's turn through uh, 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. It's one of those books that are super easy to flip over because in my Bible it's one single page, but it's right after, of course, 1 Thessalonians, before Timothy. After the epistles, Ephesians, Galatians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians. Anybody memorize the books of the Bible? We had a, we had a fun moment on Thursday. Um, different people in Kyle that had um, memorized it to a different tune of a song, you know? And, kind of, and so they were trying to quote it and they were getting the other tune. It was kind of funny. But it was great. So, um, this is evening. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 6. So it's so when we talk about our future hope, the fact that we have, there's a pig in the church. There's a piggy bank. Well, we can see it's great. <laughs> That's awesome. I just looked over, I saw a white pig. Alright, so um, and this future reality, future hope, that one day Jesus is going to return. So we're going to look at some scriptures and talk and, and learn a little bit about, okay, Jesus returning. What's going to happen when he returns? Why, why is he returning? So first, the second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. God is just. That's an awesome statement. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and grieve and give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in a blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On that day, he comes to be glorified in his holy people, and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. Paul is speaking to the Thessalonian church, and the church of Thessalonians <coughs> was dealing, like we've talked um, recently about, they were dealing with some persecution, so Paul is writing this um, book to them, and encouraging them that there is a hope that we have. That Jesus is returning, and I love that imagery there, when in a blazing fire with his powerful angels. So there's going to be there's going to be a day that God comes and he comes with a blazing fire with his holy angels. And what happens? What is he describing here that's going to be happening? It says that God is just, so he's going to be repaying, he's going to bring back payment to those that have suffered because of the sake of the gospel. He's going to come, and for those who are have put their faith, have believed in the gospel, he's going to come and bring justice to them. That gives me encouragement, because maybe there's some things in my life that I figured that hey, these are this is unjust. This is a this is an issue that I have to deal with on a regular basis. Not because God is awesome, but because sin is so destructive and it's ruining and it's, it's um, invading. Everybody's eyes look over. Those on camera, there's like the screen just turned all that color. It like, <laughs> looks like um, Joseph's coat of many colors or something. <laughs> so, um, so Jesus is coming and he's returning with blazing fire with angel, powerful angels. Why? To bring justice. To give to the unjust, to give to the ungodly what they deserve. But it's really awesome good news for us because in verse 10 it says on that day when he comes to be glorified in his holy people and we marvel that among those who believe, this includes us. So we get to we get to experience the fullness of Jesus. So no more singing about how awesome he is, no more like reading about how awesome it is. All of a sudden now on this day when he returns, we get to see and experience and be with all of the awesomeness of Jesus in our lives. Kind of excited. Like, I'm like, yes, I want this day to come. Jesus, you're going to come in all of your goodness 
it's going to be marbled at. It to be molded. When uh, when I got when I was planning to get engaged with Rachel, I remember visiting um, different um, stores, you know, to get the engagement ring. And you guys, the guys in the room have kind of gone through that, right? You go to the you go to the you go to the store and you realize, okay, I only got this amount of money. So you know, you don't try to tell them that. You're like, hey, what kind of ring? What kind of ring can I get? And you marvel at the rings. I don't know. And and sometimes I'll go in there and I really I, I like uh, nice big shiny things, right? Especially when you're talking about getting engaged. Like, we like nice big shiny things. We're looking at the and you're looking at it and I'm like, wow, it's like shining underneath the light. You know, they they have you go into the jewelry store that those perfect lights so like everything glimmers and shines. You know, I mean, the ladies know. Amy knows. Amy was uh, worked at a jewelry shop. You know, there's certain lighting that they have just so that it looks extra shiny. And you just marvel at it, and then you realize, okay, I can't afford that one. Okay, I'll go with that little step over here. That's working out. But, um, <laughs> but this marveling, that's the same kind of, I remember those moments when I was looking, okay, to find the perfect ring, the shine in the perfect way, and I get to marvel at it, and it behold it, and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. That's what we, I mean, that's what he's talking about here. When we, the believers get to marvel at it, we get to see him in all of his glory, we get to see all of his character, he's going to come and meet with us. So let's turn. Um, so, so there's one aspect of our hope that says, yes, when Jesus is going to come and he's going to return. The second aspect, for those of you in this room, we're all young, so we don't have to maybe think about the death this morning. But there is also um, hope in death, which is crazy to think about. It's like, okay, what are you talking about? Death is probably like the most morning thing, you know, like ash and black and, you know, terrible things. But in death, there is hope. So we as people who believe in Jesus and have placed our faith in Him, even in, uh, even in thoughts of death, we can have hope. This was crazy when, when I really began to wrestle with this. I was like, so actually, okay, okay so looking at Paul, Paul was, um, Paul was shipwrecked, beat, put in prison, all these different, different things, right? And he encouraged us in all those things, he said, to have joy. How can you have joy in this terrible thing? And then when I started looking at death and what what the gospel actually means for for those who die, uh, those who believe in Jesus and die, I was like, there's actually joy in dying. Which is crazy. That I would consider my life, like my life is worthless. Like for those, when you think about, um, and I've mentioned this a few times, but think about the martyrs and those who are dying for their faith, that there's actually a joy in dying. Why is that? Let's look. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I remember, I remember Rachel and I were driving in West Lafayette. Um, and we shared some of our testimony of how God was transforming us last, uh, last week. And we are driving through West Lafayette after I had returned from Nicaragua. And Rachel was, um, had been sick in the hospital. And you know that whole thing where God was asking us, "Hey, do you trust me?" And we're like, "Yes, we trust you." And we're and I've gotten back, which was regaining health, and maybe it had even been after the car accident too. And we looked at each, we were at a stoplight, and we looked at each other, and we were like, "Hey, if, if she was, if she tells me, I go, it get to the point of, if she would have died, like we would have been okay, like that would have been." That, that would have been better than, than if she were to have been well. Like, but she, she was well, so now that we can celebrate that. But if she would have died, that actually would have been okay and actually better for her. I'm like, did we just, when we said it, we, like, we said it out loud, we were like, it, we're like what? Like, did we really just say this? Like, no, like, if we really believe the gospel, if we really believe this, then it actually would be better for her or us to pass away. Why? Let's read this. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. And then we're going to read through verse 10. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must appear all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due us. 
for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. There is another um, version, a way to say verse 8, that says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So to be away from the body and at home with the Lord is better. We're confident in that. So we know the moment that we pass, we are present with the Lord. And we get to join with Him in heaven. That's a pretty awesome thing that we can start saying that Paul would say, hey, it's better, it's better if I die because I'm with, with Jesus in heaven. But right now we, we are here, so as I'm in my body, I want to live my life towards Jesus. I want to live to follow Him in every aspect of my life. I want to do good because I know that I'm here and to be here right now is great because I get to live for Jesus and I get to show others who Jesus is and I get to receive His blessings right now. But when I die, what joy! That's a, that's a joyous occasion because now I'm present with the Lord. That's, that's better than what I'm here because when I'm present with the Lord, then again, there's no more presence of sin. The effects of sin is no more. Now I get perfect union with my Father. Some may have to say, oh, help me God. That's, that's, a tough, that's a tough little follow. It is, but when we believe the truth about God, when we believe the truth about the Gospel, we begin to live a life that says, you know what? My life... It's worthless. It's, it doesn't matter because the, the, my, my goal in life is to be united with my Father in Heaven. That's, that's tough, right? Because I like living. I'm like, all I know right now, my, the reality of my life is I like ribs and steak. And I like going on, I like playing soccer. I like going on walks with Rachel. I mean, I love being married. Like, this is a great thing, like, a gift that God's given me. This is awesome. The truth is, the reality is, my hope is not in what I do. Like, actually, there's something better than what we're currently living. Is that is that hard to that's hard to maybe fathom, right? There's something better, or maybe some people are like, yes, I want that. Give me that something better. I need that, right? But there's better is to be united with the Father in heaven, where there's no more presence of sin, and where we can live in the in the full character of God in the. And like I said, we can marvel at his character where his character is all around us all the time. His perfect love. His perfect peace. Perfect provision. Healing. No effects of sin. So let's, let's continue to talk about the hope that we have. And let's go to Isaiah chapter 65. The hope that we have is if we look at the, the story of the gospel. We have, to, we have to look at the story of the gospel in the context of the whole biblical story. So from Genesis to Revelation, it's the story of God is revealed. From the beginning, God creating heaven and earth, creating Adam and Eve, and, and then to the fall of eating the fruit, to his plan to have a people who was set aside to show the world who God was and what he was like, then to Jesus who was sent then to redeem us, to put us back in right relationship with God, just like it was in the garden, to then our future hope that one day we'll be with Him where the sin is completely defeated and now we have perfect peace with Him. Let's see, Isaiah chapter 65. If you um, study a little bit, the book is, the Bible is divided into all sorts of different um, book, books. So there's, uh, there's like history books, there's poetic books, there's you know, the gospels, there's the letters, the epistles, then there's prophets. So the prophets, um, there's both, you know, real technical, we say there's major prophets and minor prophets, um, but the prophets are, are books that spoke to the people of Israel that speak to us. They spoke of not only current things, sometimes there was current correction that the prophets were bringing, but also they were foretelling. They were telling of future things that were going to happen, they were going to be reality. And so Isaiah 65 is one of those um, the future realities. So it's, it's a prophet speaking, and it both had a now word. So there was things that the people of Israel now were, were hearing, and there's also things that were, were to come. So it's really neat when we read the, the Old Testament prophets and get to study those and say, okay, what is what is there? What do we have to look forward to? It's that there's still things we can see in the Old Testament prophets of things that we have to look forward to. And this is one of them, Isaiah 65. It says this, in uh, verse 17, sorry. 65, verse 17. See, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, 
nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. And the sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. I like that last one also. So not only is there encouragement, hey, there's encouragement, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. There's going to be a new establishment, a new order established like Jesus. And in that, he's going to be rejoicing. He's going to, he's going to create Jerusalem, and it's going to be a delight. And it's people who are going to have joy. And then there's going to be no more sounds of weeping, crying. I think it's me hope. I don't like that. I don't like, I don't like crying. I don't know. I, I, I want my tend not to be very compassionate. So that's part of why I don't like crying. But another thing, I just don't like, I don't like seeing people in pain or seeing people hurt or just, like, it's just tough in those kind of situations. And since we're going to have to work, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth established and the reign of Jesus is going to be supreme over it all and there's going to be joy. So this is a new heaven, new earth that Jesus is coming in and reestablishing. So as we, as we look at this, and I want to encourage you again um, to go to our website, capitalcitychurch.org, and go under About Us. There is a section there about what we believe. And, it, and it, there's even more scriptures that um, kind of form this understanding that Jesus is returning to us. He's going to come with, blazing, with, with this blazing power. He's going to establish new heaven, new earth. And what is it going to be like? It's going to be joyful. It's going to, there's going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more sickness. There's going to be no more disease. No more effects of sin. That's a new heaven, new earth we have to look forward to. That's what's been prophesied. That's our hope in the gospel. But now let's look a little bit about us currently now, where we're at in the current situation. Let's look to 1 Peter. smaller book, but it's right from the book of Hebrews, or Hebrews of James, right towards the end, before the first Jones, so we're in first Peter. So what's really neat is, the kingdom of God, this new heaven and new earth, is both now and not yet. So it's now and yet a future reality. Just like in the in the prophets, when we read prophet, the prophecy, there was a now word that was to the people of Israel, and there's a not yet word that was for for us and for those who read. So the now, not yet thing is established when Jesus, we talked about uh, in the first week that we've been released from the penalty sin. So when Jesus um, buried, died, and rose again, crucified, buried, and rose again, there is a there is an establishment of his kingdom. So now we are his people. We have a covenant with God. We can experience the the um, we can experience the character of God. That's why we can we can preach the good news that people can get saved today. We can pray for the pray for healing, and we know that in the in the cross there was healing that was provided. We know that um, when we put our faith in Jesus, that we can have peace that passes understanding. Right? We know that when we put our faith in Jesus, He changed us to His to his family, and now we are the children of God. So that's a now reality. But there is a not yet, there is a future fulfillment where it's complete. So that's what we're, we're talking about here, this completeness. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to see how we are the now but not yet. We're actually the foretaste of the future reality of, the, of Jesus coming. Kind of like, I, I, I've heard people say, it's like we're a movie trailer for the future reality of the new heaven and new earth. We're a foretaste of the kingdom of God coming, Jesus ruling and reigning. Um, a friend Jeff Vanderbilt, he says he says we're a we're a movie trailer, but the movie is actually better than the trailer. Because <laughs> you guys watch the movies, you're like watch the trailer, like oh, I want to watch this trailer, I want to go watch this movie, and you see like. The only good parts in all of the movie were the things they said in the trailer, mm -hmm. right? So we are the people of God. Are the foretaste. We're the we're we we are what people we get to experience the people around us and each other. We get to experience the rule and reign of Jesus 
And it's kind of a taste, it's kind of like, or like, a, a, should be like honey, should taste good to people of what it will look like to be under the full rule and reign of Jesus. This is like super, this is super important. This is, this is like, we have responsibility to show people what Jesus is like. So that it actually is a hope that we have. So what, I mean like, okay, so if we, Okay, I'll use an example, but I'm gonna have to pay Rachel later. So sometimes when uh, when when we're when we go to Rachel's home, um, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, so there and and Gary and Kathy, her parents will, will say, "Hey, we're going to prepare a meal for you." Um, one time they were really excited. One time they were going to make some uh, pork chops. And I was like really excited. Okay, we're gonna we to have some. Pork chops. I love pork chops. Anybody else like pork chops? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, like it tastes good. You got you know, special because barbecue sauce on there. It's like mmm, juicy. You got you would love it when the when the when the fat around it is you know nice and rendered, so it's like kind of crispy and juicy. Anyway, um, I may be hungry for lunch, but <laughs> I get, I'm getting really excited about this, and I and I and then I we we had dinner one time and. What I tasted was not what I had expected. And so now, whenever I go there, it's like I don't, when I think about having a meal prepared for me, I'm kind of like disappointed more than like hopeful and, and, and looking forward to it, right? I'm like, oh, okay, this is not a great situation. So think about the church. We have this opportunity to be a foretaste of what heaven's like. So it's the taste of heaven that people are getting when they're interacting with us. Something that they look forward to? Oh, I can't wait till Jesus comes. Or do they taste of us and they're interacting with us and they're like, actually, I'll just pass on this. I think maybe sometimes in, in our current like uh, current church situation, maybe the last couple of years or, or whatever we talk about church history, where people are tasting of the church and they're saying, actually, I don't want that. Like that's that's not actually hopeful. Like we talk about people that when they ask. Hey, what if I talk to them and I ask them, hey, what church to go to? And usually their first question is like, hey, I mean, what do I have to wear on Sunday morning? I don't know, what do you mean what do I have to wear on Sunday morning? There's like nothing I have to wear to, you know, like get approval of God. But hey, they've tasted of this church culture that ever that, that there's tasted this judgment. It's tasted bitter to them. They receive judgment from the church. They receive, um, you know, a, a, an ill glance towards them. And so now they, when they think about church, when they think about the, the future rule and reign of, of Jesus, they don't think about hope and they don't think about freedom. They think about judgment. They think they have this bitter taste of it. We're actually an opportunity to give a foretaste of heaven that tastes like honey, that tastes sweet, that tastes like the character of God, that, that demonstrates his rule and reign over all things. It's supposed to be a hopeful thing. Let's look at 1 Peter. We're in 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to read 9 through 12. It says, You are a chosen people. I like this. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. God's special possession. That long I could just like, get excited about that. I'm like, yes, I love it when I'm affirmed by God. I love I love affirmation. And uh, so we're special people. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So we are a people, we are a royal, a royal priesthood, we are a nation, we are a special possession. Why? So that we can declare how awesome God is to the dark world around us. Yes. Once you were a people. But now you are the people of God. Once you had had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, dear brothers and sisters in Capital City Church, I, and Peter, and God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit this morning, we urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. But 
live such good lives among the pagans, among those who don't know Jesus, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. There's coming a day, right? That we said, second second and Jesus is coming. It's going to be a day that there's going to be a day that he comes. And we are to live such awesome, good lives, honoring God, loving one another, demonstrating the kingdom of God to one another, that when God comes, they actually glorify God. They're like excited to see Him. That means that people are that people are seeing God, they're tasting Him, and they want Him in their lives. They want Him to rule in His life. They're like, you guys are so awesome. I know if you guys just are a minuscule reflection of God, He must be awesome. He must be somebody that I want ruling and reigning, and reigning in my life. That's a good hope that I have. You guys taste good. People should be saying that about us. Man, I don't know what, is that, what it is about you guys. You guys just, you just ooze love towards me. You guys taste good. This is good. Like, I don't know what, I've, I've had people like that that are around us. They're like, I don't know what it is about it. I'm like, I always just sense this peace when I'm around you. Anybody ever have that? You're in a work, even in maybe, especially when I was in a workplace, I loved working at McDonald's and working, I worked at Burger's Bagels. People, every time I tell people, what? you like fast food? Well, there's two things I like about fast food. One, I got to meet a new person every like two minutes. So that was excellent for me. I just love it. But secondly, I got to be around real people. So like I was working with people and like interacting with them. And and then there would be this conversation every once in a while. Andrew, I noticed this about your life. Or I noticed this is different. Like, this isn't what I've experienced in life. What is this that you have experienced? Let's turn to uh, one, one page over, basically. First Peter chapter 3. We get an opportunity to give. Where not only they, they're teaching us, they're, they're seeing our life, they're, they're seeing a, a picture of God. But then we have an opportunity in those moments to give the hope for why we have such hope, why we have this character in our life, why this is. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Let's, uh, let's start at 13. That's okay. Oh, that's good too. Alright, so it's chapter 3, verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you would suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Yeah, God help me believe that. I believe that uh, if I suffer for doing good, then I'm blessed. Alright, it says, do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. Why is this? Why can why can Peter write such words? Don't fear when when you are threatened. Like that's like the natural thing to do, right? I mean, if something's threatened, if I'm walking out of a dark alley, like and there's creepy people walking around, like I feel threatened. There's there's a fear that comes. Why why can he say this? Again, because of the gospel. Because we have such hope that when even in death we are united with the Father. So even in a fear what may be seemingly fearful situation, I can have peace in that situation because I know no matter what harm they can do to me physically, they can't do anything to me in my eternal security. I am eternally secure in Jesus, the hope that I have because of what Jesus has done. That's the good news of the gospel. It's exciting. I don't have to fear because of the hope that I have that Jesus is going to reign supreme over my life, even in death. is so essential to us. Why I keep on emphasizing um, John 1, uh, Romans 1.16. Because if we believe the truth of the gospel, then in angry situation, it affects us. We have peace, even in fearful situations. That's what Peter's encouraging the body. So verse 15. But in your hearts, revere, revere Christ as Lord always. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that you have. So in these, Peter's saying, in these tough situations, you're going to live such good lives, 
You want to honor God, and in, in this honoring of God, you're going to be able to give the answer for the hope that you have. And the answer for the hope that we have is the gospel. It's Jesus. It's the only, it's the only good thing about, about what we have going on in our lives. It's Jesus. I mean, we've been, Peter's speaking to a church that's like literally facing persecution and death and things like that. We have Jesus that takes away the fear of death, takes away the fear of being threatened, takes away all fear and anxiety, all issues, all health things. Why? Because he's going to rule and reign and have hope in him. So what is our response then as the church to a message talking about the hope that we have in Jesus returning, rule and reign? Revelation chapter 22. Maybe a book that we don't often turn to. The book of Revelation that I had a friend ask me this week. He said, he said, I I've never read the book of Revelation. So I actually I'm, I'm afraid of reading the book of Revelation. It sounds really scary. And I said, no, the book of Revelation is the best book ever. He's like, like what do you mean? Like the book of Revelation is awesome because Jesus wins. Like, it's awesome. Like it's, it demonstrates how great God is. And like, read it. And he says, Well, what if I don't understand it? I said, Yeah, I mean there's dragons and prostitutes and people getting their head cut off and all those sort of all sorts of great things. But at the end is the message of Revelation says Jesus wins. He defeats the enemy. So Revelation chapter 22. Verse 17. This is so awesome. And this is our response. If we think about, we say anything about all these situations, we're not, maybe we're not experiencing Jesus, we know that Jesus is going to come and it's going to be really awesome when he comes. What should we be doing as a church? Right here. Verse 17 says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. What should we be doing as the church? The, the, it says the spirit and the bride. The spirit, of course, is the spirit of God. The bride is the church. We're the bride of Christ. He's our priest. We say, Come. So we look at the situations around us in our lives, and we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, intervene in this situation. When we look about what's happening in the city, we say, come, Jesus, come. When we look and say, it would be so much better when Jesus is ruling and reigning over all things, we say, come, Jesus, come. So the, the response is, so not only are we secure in the hope we put our faith in that and say, yes, I believe one day you will come, you will set your kingdom and establish it, and there will be no more presence of sin. We also say, come, Jesus, come. Come, establish your kingdom. When we think about how uh, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray in Matthew chapter 6, he says, pray this, pray that my kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. If there's things in our lives that are causing hopelessness, then what we're, our response is not to believe on the hopelessness and say, oh yeah, that must be true. It's hopeless. It's a terrible situation. No, our, our opportunity is in, in hopeless situation is to say, come, Jesus, come. Come, establish your kingdom. Come, I'm not experiencing your salvation. I'm not experiencing your character. Come, Jesus, come. So this morning I thought of an appropriate way to respond. As we look to the hope, we look to our hope and say, yes, I have hope in you, Jesus, that there that you will establish, and there will be no more presence of sin. That's a core, it's a core of the gospel. There may be, uh, I believe that there that we together can look at maybe even our current situation in our family or in our individual lives. Maybe we can look at situations in the city that are going on, or we can look at uh, situations in the nation, we can look at situations in the world and say there's there's injustices, we read it, right? God is just, there's things that are going on that don't reflect the kingdom of God. So together we have an opportunity this morning to pray and say, come Jesus, come, on each other's behalf. 
And so we're going to break down for the last uh, 10 minutes here and share with each other and pray. So we're going to share one thing. We're going to share with each other, hey, this is a situation that I see that needs Jesus. It needs his kingdom here. It needs the hope of Jesus. And then we're going to pray for one another. And the way that we're going to pray for the situation is we're going to pray, come, Jesus. Come establish your kingdom. That's our only hope, is to continue to believe on Jesus. And what's awesome is that he loves to respond to his children. The Father loves to respond, to bring kingdom into these situations. So with that, I want to, I want to play some music. So uh, then let's break down in groups of, of four, and four-ish. Four, four, and we break down in groups of four, and then we'll share with one another the things on our heart, the things that we want to see God's kingdom come into, and then pray that He will come into those situations. Let me pray before we break down in the groups. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. That we have hope that there will be no more presence of sin when Jesus you come and rule and reign over all things. And this morning, Father, we, uh, we confess to you that there are areas in our lives, there's, there's things that we're involved in, Father, where we're not experiencing your kingdom. And so we join in with the Spirit, and we join in with the church, and ask for you to come. Father, I pray as we join together that we would be encouraged this morning as we pray for 